My name is Peter Davison, and I've always loved classic cars. It's such an elegant way of travelling. I'm Christopher Timothy. I have a passion for history and Britain's great heritage. I just like finding out about the past. It's intriguing. We've been friends ever since our all creatures great and small days. Just take it easy, will you? Relax, Jim. Enjoy yourself. Woo! Take the first gear. Now, 40 years later, we're returning to the golden age of motoring and setting off on a series of classic road trips, 1930s style. You see the map in your hand. That's for navigating. Yeah, but it's, it's we not, don't have a sat nav. We don't have any other means of it's not as easy as all. It's not as easy as all that. We'll uncover incredible historical secrets. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's fascinating. <laughs> we'll tackle the toughest driving challenges we've ever faced. Take it easy, buddy. And meet some truly remarkable people. Rob. Hi, Steve. Rob. Oh, yeah. nice. You are what real heroes are, aren't you? You're the genuine <laughs> article. An absolute privilege. And me. For Thank me you so you. much. <laughs> Hats on, roof down. Home, James. Today, we're off on a seaside adventure, following roads that were popular with 1930s holidaymakers, travelling to resorts on the south coast of England. Along the way, we'll uncover the origins of one of the nation's favourite tongue twisters. She sells seashells on the seashore. She sells I seashells on the seafloor. Oh. No, no. We'll recreate a classic cliff road race. Slow down, Pete. Slow, slow down. I should be talking, but I've got no time. Sorry. <laughs> and we'll go camping 1930s style. It smells, Pete. What? It smells. <laughs> I don't remember it being as complicated as this. <laughs> but before we can start our journey, I need to pick up my driving partner for the road ahead. I'm on the southernmost tip of Hampshire's New Forest, and uh, I'm on my way to pick up Chris. And we're off on a classic British summer holiday. And we're using the routes that used to whisk millions of holidaymakers out of the cities and into the great outdoors. It's going to be fun, Chris. It's going to be fun. I'm collecting Chris from Calshot Beach. Looking out towards the Isle of Wight, it also sits on the southeastern edge of the New Forest, a place I visited a lot as a child. It's the ideal place for us to begin our very British holiday adventure. Well, typical summer holiday weather. Just as long as the rain holds off before Peter arrives. Come on, Peter. <laughs> Hi! Oh! Let's get this bit done first. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right, you? I'm oh, very well. Look, look at these beautiful beach huts. Oh, the beautiful beach hut. Yeah. It's a great view of the Isle of Wight over here. I had no idea it was so close. Well, I think this is, this is fantastic, but yeah. um, I am, uh, I'm very eager to get on our way. Oh, really? Yeah, well, We could just stay here for the week, couldn't we? No, come on, let's go. Excellent. <laughs> our set of wheels for our holiday is a Morgan 4-4, the longest running production car in the world. It has no sat-nav and is going to give us a taste of motoring 1930s style. So we're off then. We're off on the classic British summer holiday. Uh, so we're going to retrace the, 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 the steps or the, the roots of uh, all those holiday makers in the past. All the holidays that we took as children yes. were by rail. So in a way, I'll be seeing things yes. from a different perspective. <laughs> Peter and I will be driving from the New Forest along roads that took 30s holidaymakers to resorts on the south coast of England. We'll travel through Dorset visiting picturesque seaside towns before finishing our adventure on Burr Island, an exclusive 30s holiday resort off the South Devon coast. 
Burr Island. I know it exists, yeah. but that's all I know. Very beautiful place. Um, so, are you, have you packed, have you got your bucket in Spain, things like that? I've got my trunks. Oh, got very good. That's well, you can't awesome. be too careful, can no, no. I've got a tent. A tent? A tent, yeah. Why have you got a tent? Ooh, camping. Camping? Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I, no, I didn't agree to that. I didn't. <laughs> nobody mentioned camping. I'm told with you, Chris, is you never read the small print. Ah, oh, how true is that? Yes, in the boot, I brought along an original 1930s two man tent made from good old fashioned canvas. Before we motor on towards the coastal roads that will take us to the campsite where we'll be pitching it, though, we're making a short detour into the new forest. Over the cattle grid, and we are now in the new forest. I used to come here a lot. I used to come here uh, on school camping trips. Our uh, English teacher used to uh, take a bunch of us down. We would camp uh, in this little place called Fritham. And one year, uh, I think probably about the second time we've been down there, we were having a great time. And there was a little pub in Fritham. No one ever went in it. And uh, so we kind of would go down there in the lunchtimes and in the evenings, just drinking soft drinks. And they didn't mind at all because they, you know, they were selling us soft drinks. Uh, and then um, one day, uh, the games teacher at our school, he went straight back to the headmaster and said, they're down there in the pub, hanging out in the pub drinking. And immediately the uh, school holiday was scrapped. It was uh, not allowed again. Uh, and we thought this uh, 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 as a, a betrayal. Absolutely. Think, yeah. You know who you are. The New Forest is a special place. But we're not just here to admire its beauty or to visit the places Peter holidayed in his youth. We are on our way to the National Motor Museum at Bewley. Owned by the Montague family, it's home to a very special car that I'm keen to drive for the first time. Amazing. Well, hello. Welcome. Well, Montague. Very good to meet you. Peter, very nice to meet you. And this oh, eventually you, will, will be, will will be Chris. <laughs> Sorry, it takes a long time to get out of these. Oh, these low cars. Chris. How do you do, sir? Good to meet you, Welcome too. To Look at this. This is Bessie, a vintage car replica that featured in Doctor Who on and off across two decades. First driven by the third Doctor, John Pertwee, in 1970. By the time I took on the role 11 years later, Bessie didn't feature, so I never actually got to drive her. How, how did you acquire it? Why, why well, is it yours? Well, actually, it's not mine. It's on loan from the BBC. I've been entrusted with her. Oh, I see. As a model, these were produced as kit cars in the late 1960s to, to go on a, a 1954 Ford Popular chassis. Um, and, you know, they were just a fun novelty car. Mm. Uh, fiberglass body, uh, but this one, of course, is a little bit special. You can see from the number plate who won. And do you have to keep it in the, in the uh, exact condition it was? Because but I seem to remember it wasn't very reliable. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, you, c you can actually see that in yeah. some, some of the episodes. Also, I have to say, actors are never very good at driving cars on camera. And, right. and there is a shot of John stalling this. But for you, of course. For I me? Think, I think I get to oh, well, ride in it. Yes. And it's going to actually work this time. Oh, yes, she's <laughs> working. She's running just fine. That's fantastic. Oh, you're going to love this, Chris. I love it. The gauntlet's laid down. Can I do a better job than John Pertwee? Right, Chris. <laughs> that's, a, that's a start. <laughs> I found the starter motor. Now for the gears. I'm really very excited. I can tell. I'm a doctor and I'm driving the doctor's car. Okay, here we go. Wish was slow. Whoa! I thought I'm first first. No, no wonder John Purby had trouble with this. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> look at this. On a smooth takeoff. <laughs> I'm driving Bessie and it's working. <laughs> After three series of All Creatures Great and Small, in 1981, I became the fifth doctor playing the role for three years. Does the recognition of you, how does it vary between all creatures and Doctor Who? Oh, for uh, well, I think 
I think the basis of everything to do with me is, is, is Tristan uh, um, in All Preacher. So I, I think even when I was Doctor Who, it was kind of, oh, it's that bloke Tristan playing Doctor Who. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and that's absolutely fine. Uh, um, Doctor Who is very good for calling things, things out, you know, so if people recognise you, they can easily say things like, Oi, mate, where's your TARDIS? Oh, yeah. It's only taken 38 years, but I finally got to drive Bessie. The whole thing is rather strangely put together in terms of pedals, so that's a bit difficult. And you, I was doing it with an audience, uh, and also uh, Lord Montague had just told me that actors are terrible driving cars on camera. <laughs> in all the years, he never got near the car, did he? So, hey, and I got to go in a Doctor Who car too, so that's got to be good, isn't it? <laughs> Leaving Bessie and the new forest behind, we're back in the Morgan and heading for the coast. Right, so... Where are... Oh, yes, I see. What? This is sort of Boscombe-ish. <laughs> no, it's it it's Boscombe-ish. Yeah, Boscombe-ish. What more do you want? Come on. We're going in the right direction. We're on our way to Bournemouth a popular 1930s holiday destination to find out more about its surprising and little-known motoring heritage. We can play um, who, who Sees the Sea first. <laughs> we can, play that we can play what? Who Sees the Sea first. OK. Whoever sees the sea first... Loses. Uh, loses. And, uh, no, and, and wins. The other, no, wins. Well, the, therefore the other person has to buy the ice cream. OK, so I buy ice cream if you see the sea first. Uh, that's correct. As we approach the seafront, our eyes are peeled. I see the sea! No, you don't. You just see a big... Uh, that's not the sea. That's not physically... The, all you can see is sky. No, no, no! There's a big expanse of sky. That's not the sea! sea. Ah, that's the sea! Daniel! Yes! yes. Don't <laughs> confound you! <laughs> I'm going to one. Can you? Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to read. <laughs> He's bumped in the road. <laughs> 34 miles into our trip, we've reached Bournemouth. In the golden age of motoring, holidaymakers flocked to its sandy beaches, and we're on the way to the seafront to find out more about its little known motoring history. Right, so now we're getting further away from the sea. But you know what you're doing, don't you? No, you're the navigator, Chris. <laughs> But what? <laughs> you see the map in your hand. That's for navigating. Yeah, but it's, it's we not. We don't have a sat nav. We don't have any other means. It's not as easy as all. It's not as easy as all. We're meeting Gary, the owner of a Sunbeam Alpine Series Five, an iconic sports car that has its roots here in Bournemouth. Gary. Hi, Peter. Hi. Hey, sir. This is Chris. Hi, mate. Hi, Chris. Based on the existing Sunbeam Talbot, his design caught the eye of the Roots hierarchy, who further developed it and launched it in 1953. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good fun. Gary, thank you very much indeed. Thank yeah, you. Great, great pleasure, mate. Thank you. Really good, really good. Having uncovered a little-known gem of South Coast motoring history, we leave Bournemouth in our rear-view mirror. I like the uh, Sunbeam Alpine. So do I. You know, I think I heard that it was what, James, James Bond's first car, is that right? Yeah, the the, the, a blue one in Doctor No. Yeah. We're now almost a third of the way into our holiday adventure, and after crossing Poole Harbour, our route takes us south towards Corfe Castle and the Purbeck Hills. We used to go on caravan holidays to Swanage, which is very close to Corfe Castle, and we would go out for a day trip, look around there. And there is Corfe Castle. That's oh, right. right. This is an area of outstanding natural beauty. And one of the guidebooks in our glove compartment has some advice to help 1930s holidaymakers find a spot where they could fully appreciate how special the countryside they were travelling through was. Right. You keep to the left after Corfe. After Corfe Castle. And soon after Church Knoll, 
take to the Purbeck Hills. Right. It does not matter which you choose out of the two or three roads hereabouts, so long as you come to that fine place where the road lies over the hill crest like a piece of string blown by the wind. OK. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> it's lovely. Doesn't that conjure up? It does. Now all we have to do is... A piece of string. All you've got to do is look out for a piece of roads, string. I hope the roads haven't changed since 1936. Is that let's right? hope. Let's hope. While the guidebook may have waxed lyrical about the viewpoint, its directions to it are a little imprecise. It said take any, any road, did it say? One of three. Are you suggesting that we should have chosen one of the other no, two? No, well, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any of them. Be patient. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I just saw a sign for army rangers. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay, just get your head down. Thankfully, there are no military exercises today. There it is, look. And we arrive in one piece at the stunning Creech viewpoint. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Well, it is nice, isn't it? It is nice, yeah. Yeah, very. Where's the piece of string? Throughout the 1930s, this view would have looked much as it does today. But at the end of the decade, its character was changed dramatically by the outbreak of war. A lot of this land was requisitioned and, and, uh, uh, um, for army training and for billeting of troops in probably temporary uh, uh, um, barracks leading up to D-Day. And it was from over there, just over the hill there, in Portland, where thousands and thousands of troops left uh, on D-Day. Extraordinary. It's the, it's the juxtaposition of this beautiful landscape yeah. and war. Yeah, would have looked very it? different. What, and that water would have been littered with warships, wouldn't it? Yeah, really amazing. A bit parky, though. Yeah, yes, a bit parky. <laughs> Driving down from the viewpoint on the Purbeck Hills, we're now heading to Weymouth, one of the towns that was transformed at the end of the 1930s. Do you, you don't remember anything about the Second World War? Do you? I do, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. I, what I remember is um, my parents lived in a mansion block of flats in Warwick Gardens, and the basement was the was commandeered as an air raid shelter, so it was full of bunks. And it was quite noisy, lots of conversation and Babies crying, and and then they would go quiet, and you'd, and I would be aware that everyone was listening, and you'd hear. Then there'd be a silence, and then there'd be a, and the place would shake a bit. I remember the next morning, and there were houses where, and the fronts had been blown off. I never, never forgotten it. Born ten years after Chris. I have no memory of the Second World War. But having arrived in Weymouth, we're meeting a woman who lived through the dramatic changes that war brought to this seaside resort. Hello. Poppy, I'm Chris. I'm happy to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hi, this Poppy. Hello. Peter. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Poppy Butcher was a child when her hometown was turned into a vital military port. She was here when thousands of GIs were shipped in during the 1940s and is now the proud owner of a World War II American Willys Jeep. How on earth, Bobby, did you come into possession of an American Jeep? Well, my husband was very keen on Jeeps uh -huh. and we, we bought it in 1988. Right. Okay. Ever since. It's fab. <laughs> Is it possible to, to have us to sit yes, in it? Will you take, yes, you wouldn't take us for a drive, would you? Well, I, I can't drive. I used to, but I shrunk. Oh, and I, and I, I couldn't see it with a windscreen, no. and I couldn't oh. put cushions because yeah. I couldn't reach the pedal. Ever the gent, G.I. Davison is stepping into the breach, and Poppy is taking us around her town to explain how it was changed by the war. So there would have been barbed wire all along these beaches all along, here? All along the front here, yes, yeah. And sandbags and... Yeah, yeah. Over there is where all the landing craft took the American Say it, soldiers. All oh, right. All along here, and oh, all right. these, all these big hotels right. were taken over by the American troops. Right. Okay. 
Yes. They would take over the best yeah. hotels, wouldn't they? Yeah. There's one of the American Memorial there. Uh-huh. Did you like having the American Memorial? Oh, very much so, yes. Yeah. Well, they had tin, very, like, tin food, and uh, we used to, um, the girls, they used to go out with them, and they had, like, a tin of fruit, and they used to break open the top and drink the juice and throw the fruit away. So we used to collect all the tins up and take home. And have fresh fruit. Yes. I love the fruit from well, the tin oh, Amazing. <laughs> Chewing gum, cigarettes, because, you know, they're hard yeah, to get, well. yeah. In 1944, aged just 15, Poppy went to work in the stores in Weymouth Docks. A year later, she joined the rest of the town celebrating victory in Europe. Seafront was full up. There was doing the hokey cokey and... Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, doing the conga, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. Like so many others of her generation, Poppy is an incredible woman. She's a leading light in the local D-Day Museum, just a few miles away in Portland, where she's arranged a driving surprise for us with museum director Steve. Hello, Steve. Hello. 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 I'm Peter. I'm Stephen. Okay, Pleased to meet Stephen. you. Hi, Steve. Chris. Chris, pleased to meet you. You too. Welcome to Portland. Yes, Thank you very welcome, much. Welcome to this vehicle. Is it a truck or is it a <laughs> tank? Basically, it's an M3 half-track, OK? Right. But this same kind of vehicle would have been transported over on Absolutely. D-Day, yeah. Yes. So these are the exact same vehicles that's loaded from Portland yeah. to go over to Normandy. And how often uh, is this driven, actually driven? Quite often. Is it? Yeah, all Are our, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All our vehicles we take out quite regularly. We had her out in a convoy a few weeks back. Um, we occasionally nip to the pub in them. Are you still driving? Yeah, yeah, bit, bit heavy on the steering. OK. But a strong lad like yourself would be all right. <laughs> so uh, can, we, can we have a go on it? Absolutely, well, absolutely. Oh, amazing. Let's give it, it a go. Okay, Who wants to wear the helmet? You're coming with me. I'm putting this on, Pete, not because, not just because I like wearing it. Right. A safety precaution. OK. okay. Take it easy, buddy. <laughs> Oh! You're doing good. Yeah, really good. <laughs> Bobby, thank you, thank you. It's been a, an absolute privilege. And me. For thank me you so you. much. <laughs> God bless you. It's been great fun. Yeah. The highlight of today was meeting Poppy without doubt. And the fact that we went through Weymouth and she described things and pointed out things and, and lived it again, didn't she? And it was, oh, it was just extraordinary, extraordinary. The following morning, we're back on Civvy Street and motoring along in the Morgan towards an authentic 1930s holiday experience. As I told you, we got a tent in the back. So we are camping, are we? Well, I've got a tent, Chris. That's all I'm saying. Well, all I'm saying is that it's never been mentioned to me. I see the sea. Does that mean I win? Do we have a running pair? Oh, I see the sea. Oh, well, yes, was I that can. ooh? Was I that can. ooh because you nearly drove into that car? Yeah, that was a fierce. <laughs> and also, ooh, it's the sea. Uh, just, let me wipe, just let me wipe the sweat from my brow. <laughs> We've now reached the B3157, better known as the Jurassic Coast Road. An 18-mile stretch running from Weymouth to Bridport. Sadly, because you're, you're, you're driving, you can't really look at it, but I'll tell you what it, how spectacular it is, all right? I can't, yeah, I trust you implicitly. <laughs> wow, it's spectacular. Oh, it's that good, is it? <laughs> Running parallel in parts to the cliffs made famous in Broadchurch, the road was named because the rocks along this coastline are a dinosaur fossil hunter's paradise. They also supposedly gave rise to perhaps the nation's most famous tongue twister. She sells seashells on the seashore. She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh, no, no. I've 
she G sells cell seashells, seashells on the sea seashore. Seashells, no. Legend has it that this tongue twister is based on the 19th century paleontologist Mary Anning. She was responsible for a number of highly significant finds, but tender restrictions meant she lived in relative obscurity and was often forced to sell her discoveries to make ends meet. She sells yeah. sea shells on the sea shore. Yeah. She, she sells sea shells on the sea shore. If you don't think about it too much, yeah. it's OK. As we're making good time, we've decided to stop off at Charmouth Beach to do a little fossil hunting of our own. Just as motorists in the golden age of motoring would have done. See any one of these could yeah, be. I know, I know. I, I'm not sure it's our thing, really. <laughs> Looking for well, dancers. I mean, I'm just hoping that <laughs> Hawkeye Timothy will spot something. <laughs> okay. You you want, you'll sort of sniff it out. A bit of a eureka. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know. Our mistake was not to get, you know, David Attenborough along here. David, well, he was here, apparently, a couple of years ago. Was he? Yeah. Bet he had more luck than us. <laughs> <laughs> Having come up empty-handed, we motor on. Leaving Charmouth Beach, we're heading on past Lyme Regis to the next stop on our 1930s holiday adventure. It's time to try and persuade Chris that camping 1930s style is a good idea. Do you have any fondness for camping? Do I what? Do I have any <laughs> fondness for camping? <laughs> you must be insane. You know, you know me. Surely, anybody who knows me. If that, if, that, if you said, does Chris Timothy like camping? It's, I guarantee they'd all say no. I don't it's think a so. conversation starter. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How about caravans? I, I'm not over enamoured, but I did very early on. In my first marriage, yeah. we, uh, I was working in the theatre when we got married, and we had a caravan in Barmouth in North Wales for a week. And you, it was... You went, you, you went, hang on, let me so, get this right. So you, it was a belated honeymoon in a caravan. Let me get this right. You went on your honeymoon in a caravan. I, it was in the early 60s, <laughs> and I was at the National Theatre yeah. earning £14 a week. Yeah. But, but the combination of a honeymoon can I, how can I put this delicately? A honeymoon and a caravan. Don't go together? Not really, not, in, not as far as I uh, uh, um, can see. If romance is not dead. Camping and caravanning may not be my cup of tea, but back in the 1930s, greater access to cars and the introduction of paid holidays helped boost their popularity. 80 years later, they remain a popular way of getting away. We've popped off the road to meet Angela and George. Hello. Hello. Peter. Good to see you. Peter. A couple who fell in love with a classic 30s caravan and painstakingly restored it to its former glory. Look at this. Yes. Tell us about this. this. Well, this Amazing is um, uh, this is a Winchester imp. This one was uh, one of four made. In and uh, it's the only known survivor. And how long they, have you had it? Well, we've had it seven years, and we've rallied up and down the country in it. Quite, you rallied quite, up and down? <laughs> rallied up and down in the country with the club. Wow. Can we have ideal, a look inside? Of course. Rally. By all means, come and have a look. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I like oh, the inside wow. even better than the outside, actually. As you can see, it's like a TARDIS inside. It's, that's what's clever, isn't it? It's the, mm -hmm. Yes, like, it's nice Every little inch of space is utilised here. Yes. yes. So here we've got the sink here. This is the original sink. Yeah. And then we'll so this that also folds flat, does it? That also folds flat. That comes down. And this is. And, and this that's is the cooker. The that's cooker. the original Botto cooker. With with the little drawer. Yeah. And you use all this, do you? We you use, use it. Yes, stuff? we use it all the time. Wow, this is extraordinary. I fell in love with it as right. soon as I saw this. Uh, I had to have it. Right. It was just wonderful. I am so impressed yes. by it. I mean, so impressed. Yeah. Yeah. But it has not changed my attitude to caravans. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It hasn't. No, it's, I mean, I, I will admire them for as long as they exist, <laughs> but I have no desire to be in a caravan. Even <laughs> less well, do I have a desire to put up a fizzing tent. Well, I tell you what, I tell you what <laughs> I'm though, sorry. The, the way to appreciate caravans is to spend a few nights in a tent. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then you'll think, yes. Yes. luxury. That would yes. be amazing. Yes. Not, yes. Come not, on! That's not a chance! Let's do it. Time to try and change Chris's mind about camping. Yeah, you take that. So, I thought we could do it, like, here. Having found the perfect spot... <laughs> oh, lots of bits to fall off. We're pitching an original 1930s tent. It smells, Pete. What? It smells. <laughs> I don't remember it being as complicated as this. <laughs> OK, where's the, where's the other hole? So these have got to ah, be... Ah, like a skirt, yeah. Right, Hey! Okay. Just hold, the, you hold your end up, Chris. I am, I'm holding my hand up. Psst. Yeah? <laughs> no hands. A camper's guidebook that would be familiar to 30s campers has some wise advice. The one who invites a friend and who has taken part in a previous expedition should be skipper. It will not be necessary to state this formally to the chum, but there must be no doubt left about it. Chris? Yeah? Have you finished yet? No! We're going to move on. It's a tent. Well done. You did it in very good time, I thought. Yes. You're a real man, ain't you? <laughs> Let's get it. I think it's really bloody good. <laughs> I do. Middle is a bit of a through draft. Would you think ill of me if we went and sought out a hotel now? <laughs> Chris, you're staying here. Good night. No, come on, I can't spend the night in here. I'm too old for this. The following morning, having checked out of a nearby hotel, thank goodness, we motor on towards Torquay. Water on both sides. The English Riviera. The English bit. Riviera, yes. We're on our way to the Babacombe area of the town, home to a beautiful funicular cliff railway that was first opened over 90 years ago. In the 1960s, racing from Oricum Beach at the foot of the railway to the top of the twisting cliff road that runs alongside was a popular pastime. We've been given special permission to put our own spin on it. Okay. I thought it might be fun to race the, race the train up the hill. Well, I'll go on the train, is that right? <laughs> Just, well, the happy and bends and all that. So it's the Babicom Railway. It's the Babicom Railway. Up Oricum Hill. Oricum Hill. And it's a race against the car and the train. Yes, it and gets the, to the so, so it's in the lap of the Godicums. Oh. Dear, did you get that out of your book of bad jokes? No, it just it just it just came to me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Well, that's a bit, that's a bit of excitement. Yes, let battle commence. Let's. I'm not driving the train, am I? Thankfully, not. The railway ascends over 700 feet from the bottom of the cliff to the top. Whilst I'm in the train, Peter will be racing up the road, which measures over 2,000 feet and includes four hairpin bends. Morgan against the Babacom Cliff Railway. I just want to see him take off as we take off. And there he is. Don't go yet, don't go yet, don't go yet. I feel just like Lewis Hamilton. Yes. Slow down, Pete. Slow, slow down. I should be talking, but I've got no time. Sorry. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, is the car there? Is the car there? Yes, it is! <laughs> yeah, well done. Well done, you smug whatever. <laughs> 
Triumphant in victory, the mighty Morgan carries us forward into Torquay, the heart of the English Riviera, and the birthplace of the nation's favorite murder mystery writer. You know, um, Agatha Christie was, uh, her birthplace was Torquay. I did know that, actually. Did, did you? I did, yes. I can't tell you anything, can I? <laughs> Have you ever been in a, a, an Agatha Christie thing? No, Shire? I haven't. Have you? Yeah, I've been in um, actually two Miss Marples. The in pocket full of rye, I was the murderer. With around two billion copies of her book sold worldwide, Agatha Christie stands second only to Shakespeare as the best-selling British writer of all time. So we are heading towards her holiday home, her, okay. her sort of place of escape, really, I think. Agatha adored her holiday home, and it featured in some of her novels. But as she wrote in her autobiography, it wasn't the only great passion in her life. I will... Sorry. Cause, cause, sorry, I'm trying to read, Peter. <laughs> I will confess, here and now, that one of the two things that have excited me most in my life, and the first was my car, my grey, bottle-nosed Morris Cowley. Can, can you tell me what the other thing that was most excited her in her life? Yes, she dined with the Queen. Oh, OK. Blimey. Sounds as though Agatha was one of the first petrol heads. We're going to find out what all the fuss was about by taking a look at the same model of the car she loved so much at her holiday home, Greenway House. Agatha lived here for 38 years, and three of her books featured the house, including the Poirot mystery, Dead Man's Folly. In 2000, her family gifted this special place to the National Trust. Hello, I'm Hello. Peter. Hello, welcome. Hi, I'm Chris. Hello, I'm Elaine. Elaine is one of the managers. Right, so it's a very impressive house to have as a holiday home. It is. It? <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> and it's got this wonderful view. Oh, yeah, great views around the dark, particularly from her bedroom, which was a lot of her inspiration. Right. You can imagine Poirot walking up the grand staircase yeah. to his bedroom, looking out of the French windows. It's here. <laughs> yeah. She wrote quite prolifically. She right. wrote over 86 books. She wrote numerous plays, poems, and poetry. The Mousetrap being her most famous play, which is still going on in London today. Now, Chris, uh, when we were coming down, he, he, he read this quote from Agatha Christie, where right. she says one of, the, one of the two most exciting things in her life was driving her Morris Cowley. She was very fond of her Morris Cowley. Right. She was quite a nervous driver to start with, but at that time, as you know, you didn't have to pass a driving test. There wasn't as much traffic on the road as what there is now, so she basically got in the car and drove. Excellent. Which is just what I'm going to attempt to do. OK, here we go. Good luck. Um, now, the very the good thing about this, Chris, is I noticed that it's got um, a Christopher Timothy profanity hooter. You know? So every time For I those go moments to say, when you get a bit carried away, I'll just go... I've got to say, this place is marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite enough of that. It's time to follow in Agatha's tyre tracks. Are you, uh, are you quite comfortable, Mr Timothy? I, I, feel, I feel I'm in the position to which I'm entitled. <laughs> it's really comfortable and really nice. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to try and get in the second gear. Is that second? Yep. Well done. Thank you. You're coming along. <laughs> and you look very at home, can I say, in the back. Well, you know. It's one of those cars where they put the brake on the right-hand side, so you just don't know where the brake is when you have to slow down. Plus, the brake isn't the greatest in the world, which, of course, they weren't on those cars. But, yeah, I could get, I could get used to it. Someone wanted to give me one, I suppose. <laughs> Driving away from Greenway, we head further into the Devonshire countryside. The roads get a little... a little hairy, shall we say. Cue the tractor! <laughs> We're closing in on our final destination, Burr Island. It's home to an elegant Art Deco hotel, which was one of Agatha's treasured writing spots and the setting for two of her novels, 
and then there were none and evil under the sun. At high tide, the island is cut off and a sea tractor transports guests to and from the hotel. I shall be a bit narked if we can't go on the tractor. Oh, will you? Now that, you, now that you, you've you offered it up. If we're going to make Chris's wish come true, we need to get a move on. We're in a race against the retreating tide. Time and tide wait for no man. It's not waking all the way for us. Well, fingers crossed, eh? Yeah. But it'll be, it'll be worth it, I promise you. <laughs> There you go, there it is, look. Wow. But unfortunately, as you can see, there's no sea between us and the island. Never mind. I so wanted to go yeah. on the tractor. Yeah, I know. We're out of luck. Time to put our walking shoes on. I am seriously knocked about the tractor. <laughs> I'm seriously. <laughs> it's a nice walk. Chris, and when we get there, you, you can look at the tractor. <laughs> the nice view of the, the hotel, you see, look, and it's, it's had a notable uh, guest in the past from um, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Yeah, I know yeah, that. Yeah. Noel Coward. Yeah. Um, Churchill. Churchill and the Beatles, I believe, stayed here as well. Now, here, it's the sea tractor. This is what we should have been on. Jolly big, isn't it? Yeah. This has been around for, for some time, and um, just sorry we didn't get here in time. Didn't you promise me a drink in the bar? Uh, yeah, OK. <sighs> We've definitely earned a drink. And to match the elegant surroundings, it can only be one thing. Wow. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Journey's thank end, you. chaps, journey's end. There he is. Cheers. Salute. Cheers. Well done. You got, likewise. We got here. Yeah. What a few days, eh? Mm. So we've had British weather, we've had beautiful weather. We've had dodgy old, roads and yeah. wide roads. Yeah, we've had old caravans. Broad roads, old tents. caravans. We've erected right the tent. Yeah. Oh, what? And then we've ended up here. This wonderful view and, and the glass is, of it, it is. Yeah. It's stunning. I mean, it is. And it's. Uh, oh, I've spilt it now. How many? How many? Well, you see, you're not used to champagne. <laughs> no, I'm really not. It's, it doesn't, it's, you, know, you hold the glass like that. One, uh, one finger up. Right? Okay, okay, all right. Okay. okay. You don't hold it by the stem. I've been learning from you my whole life, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>